Hi, Kevin. Hey, how are you? Good. So you're sounded for now. Yes, I am. Welcome, Kevin. Hello to our folks in the viewing area. I'm Polly Dawkins. I am a guest interviewer today on our live stream with our board member and good friend, Kevin Kwok. Hi, Kevin. Hey, everyone. Greetings from Boulder. Wonderful. It's where it's finally getting a little bit warmer. Tiny bit warmer. I'm waiting for that balmy spring. Oh, aren't we both? Aren't we both? Well, Kevin, I thought we'd uh, start our conversation by introducing you and um, sort of get to know you a little bit and your story. So to start off, maybe it would be helpful for our viewers to learn a little bit about your background. And then I'm going to ask you maybe to define yourself using a few different nouns. But to start off, you know, who are you as you come into this uh, live stream and, and um, what's your connection to our work? Well, <clears throat> I'll start by saying that um, I've come into this club of being uh, a Parkinson's club member, not by choice, but like all of us, uh, through a twist of fate. <clears throat> I've been living with Parkinson's now for, it's going on, I can't believe it now, but for 14 years. And uh, I'm happy to say that the first decade has been really quite good. Uh, <clears throat> and I would call that the good era in mm -hmm. here. Uh, I've been a lifelong pharmaceutical biotech executive uh, in addition to being uh, living with Parkinson's. And for 12 years, I managed to maintain a career, um, which uh, in many cases, you see people working four or five. But I was able to sort of shift and pivot my roles to make myself, what's the right word? Um, functional and actually adding benefit to, to, to the ecosystem that I worked in. Mm. Um, so um, my background is as a, a clinical scientist. I'm a pharmacist by training, I have my doctoral degree. Uh, but the things that I come to you with today are, are not scientific, but more just experiential as someone, a fellow person living with Parkinson's. Um, one of the greatest things that has happened to me is the relocation here to Boulder, thanks to the Davis Finney Foundation. I remember being at a board retreat with you all and thinking about what I was going to do with this new life of mine. You know, I was just coming off a divorce, uh, thinking about where I wanted to live. I, I've been living in, in the Bay Area, California, for almost 25 years before that. And it was time for a change and to, and to hang a new shingle. And, and I remember chatting with Davis and Polly and Connie. Uh, and Connie said to me, Kevin, you should really think about coming here to Boulder. Her comment was, I think you'll live better and live longer if you sure. come here just because of the resources for those of us with Parkinson's. So I sort of bit the bullet and knowing only the three of you moved here. Uh, and that was part of the beginning of era two, which I'll go into in a second. But, Super. Um, and for, this, for people watching, uh, Davis is, is Davis Finney, our founder, and uh, Kevin refers to Connie as Connie Carpenter Finney, uh, Davis's wife, care partner, and uh, board member, co-founder of the foundation. So that's who, that's who Kevin's referring to. Yeah, sorry about that. I should have explained it. That's but I've right. been on the board with all of you for the last several years, and that has been very meaningful in adding uh, what I would call 
a meat to this whole life of living well with Parkinson's uh, yeah. in, in here. Um, so I would describe my first few years as being sort of blindly optimistic and naive. Mm. You, you know, I, I went through this, when I was actually diagnosed with Parkinson's, there was a lot of denial going on. And in, for the first few years, I, I actually didn't tell a lot of my colleagues, you know, that I was going through this because I didn't want the choice assignments to go to someone else. I didn't want the pity party. And so I sort of just internalized it and, and lived the first several years without telling a soul. Um, what were your symptoms? Your, what were your original symptoms that you were able to sort of, as you said, be in the closet and not show your colleagues? Well, I think I was faking a lot of it, to be honest. But, uh, the motor symptoms were not very severe for me, but I did notice things like walking. Uh, I would take a lot of business trips and struggle walking, you know, from terminal gate to gate, flight to flight. I, I felt myself dragging along. Um, mm. uh, but, but my mind was still intact and I was still, you know, pretty lucid minded uh, as far as uh, functioning. So I was able to sort of fake it till I make it sort of mentality mm. for, for quite a few years. Um, and back then, I was very into this, you know, damn it, I'm going to beat this Parkinson's. So there was this element of exercise like crazy uh, and do all the things that you can try to sort of feign your way through. Um, but then there came this issue of the decision for early DBS. And so four years into that, Kevin, um, if you don't mind me interrupting and asking you a few no, questions. Please, please yeah. do. So early on, you were fake it till you make it and hiding your symptoms, perhaps, as you said, maybe not all that well, but you, you, did, you were able to continue to work really well. Um, when, when you finally made the decision to tell work, tell your colleagues and your boss, um, how did you do that? How did you make that decision? And what was their reaction? Tell us a little bit about that experience. Well, <clears throat> so at the time I was a partner in a search firm doing high level executive placements uh, in the pharmaceutical and biotech industry. Uh, we were international, so I had an international set of clients that I was working with. And, and the reason why I, I came open on this thing was was because uh, I had an unexpected invitation to go through the surgical procedure, deep brain stimulation. Uh, I see. And so I figured if I was going to come out with a shaved head and and have to go into hiding for six weeks in recovery, people were going to ask. Sure. Uh, sure. I was either in some rehab center or something was going on in my life, but. The decision to, to, to go into DBS really forced me to come open. And mm -hmm. I remember going to the CEO and the president uh, of the North American practice, and they were supportive, but they really didn't know what to do with an individual that was a senior level partner uh, in the firm. And so I could sort of read the writing on the wall. This was a high, high pace, high stress living where you sort of were only as good as your current month of work. And so I realized that the, the system that I was living as a part of where, where you eat what you kill wouldn't work for someone like me with Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. uh, and so after, shortly after I had DVS, I was doing fine physically, but I started preparing myself for the fact that maybe this was not the career track for me. And I ended up joining one of my clients 
who, who actually worked in drug development on a Parkinson's drug. And I, I went internally into that company. Uh, but it was a major, major step back, both in responsibility uh, and pace, you know, to make that move. Uh, yeah. And at the time, uh, it kind of hurt a little bit to come off the fast track. But oh, sure. it, the other side to me said that maybe it's time for a proactive change. Wow. So you took the decision early after your diagnosis to have deep brain stimulation surgery or yeah. DBS surgery. How many years diagnosed were you? I was four years in. And so that's very early. very early for people to like deep brain stimulation. Um, yeah. I was inspired actually by an article. One of the things when you're in the art industry you get to read a lot of the medical journals that cross mm -hmm. our desk. And so I remember in February uh, that year, uh, an article came out in the New England Journal of Medicine on the European uh, philosophy and culture of deep brain stimulation, which was to, to start it earlier in people. And back then here in this country, DVS was something you reserved for later stage. And in this particular paper, they show that by going early, you actually might see greater benefits and possibly even disease modification, which was something being batted around at the time. Um, so I was being treated at Stanford by one of our former board members, Dr. Helen Bronte Stewart, who is the leader in DVS research. And, she, and I spoke with her and she said, you know, I always thought you'd be a great candidate, uh, but I think it may be a little early and, you know, the surgeons may not d take the risk of someone as young and as healthy as you undergoing them. So I, literally they went silent on me for about eight months. And then all of a sudden I just called to come in and I thought they were going to, you know, gently let me off the hook and say, you know, come back <laughs> in a few years, son, and, you know, maybe we'll look at you more serious. But after about an hour of talking to them, I said, why am I here? And they said, well, didn't we tell you you've been picked for DVS and we've scheduled you for, you know, three weeks from now? And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, wow. I haven't told anyone yet what's going on. Here and so I, I almost backed out of it. Yeah, it forced your hand to talk to work pretty quickly. Yeah, and, and I had told a few uh, select uh, partners and colleagues, but not to the whole company. Um, they they were hugely supportive, I will say, and my taking me out of the uh, that career track was my own decision. Or for yeah. my own well-being. Yeah, uh, it, and it sounds it, like you reduced your stress significantly by making that change. Huge, huge, huge. Yeah. I we, mean, hear, I was, we hear that from our community all the time, Kevin, don't we? That reducing yeah. stress is, is just critical to living well. Oh, completely. Yeah. You can feel it coming on. The upcoming, you know reports or meetings or client-facing interaction. Um, it's almost like it, it goes hand in hand with worsening of symptoms in there. Yeah. And so for me, you know, I thought I could fake those symptoms. I used to send my colleagues to the meetings ahead of time so I wouldn't have to walk with them down the hallway. Uh, and he, I think I lived a life where I was a little deceitful both to myself and uh, and to others and to my family for that matter uh, mm. in here. Um, but I was very lucky. I, I went to a client of mine. They were friends uh, and, and they allowed me to sort of adjust and, and adapt my career. 
And I started to go into what was the buzzword at the time in the industry. And that was called patient engagement and patient centricity. And it was this idea of going back to patients and listening to them. What a novel idea, right? Listen to your customers and develop programs that really benefited, you know, what the what patients wanted. And so I was able to sort of pivot and turn this recruiting role into a role where I became the the microphone to the patient community back to the company. And Mm -hmm. I was on the FDA, I testified and and had a really great role. Uh, In my mind, I told people I had the best job in the company Mm -hmm. because I was able to go out and talk to people like me and then in, influence the company based on our learning. And that's uh, how I met you, right? That's how you got introduced to the work of the Davis Finney Foundation was in that engagement role. You were really engaged in the community doing that work. And we we met up at a at an event and you spoke yeah, on a panel. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So we were lucky that you had that role because we got to know you. and. And, you know, my experience, Kevin, we've known each other for a number of years, is that you do that role so well and have done it for years is really speaking on behalf of of people living with Parkinson's and and care partners. Well, I I think I consider myself, I used to call myself a patient advocate, but then I call myself now a patient activist because advocacy implies a little more passive approach. And I really like to make change in the way uh, that I've entered in as a patient. You know, all my career, I watched the advances that were happening in the pharmaceutical industry based on patient volunteers. And it was that volunteerism where I said, it's now time for me to give back. And I remember Mm -hmm. going, Dr. Bronte Stewart early on in my diagnosis saying, how do I give back? And her comment was, what do you mean by giving back? And I said, well, I feel like I've ridden on the shoulders of other patients who've got us here to where we are today. And now it's my role to help us move to the next, the the next generation of of this disease. Hmm. So, you know, for me, those first 10 years were were sort of ignorant bliss. You yeah. know, I was riding high, feeling good about doing the best I could to, to beat this disease. I was cycling with you all. I, I was still skiing. I was boxing, doing yoga. I mean, I felt almost invincible at that point mm-hmm. in time. Um, yeah. But I, I'm sorry to say that that was almost faking myself out, hmm. you know, in there. And that sort of leads me to this new phase that I'm entering. It's called the midlife crisis of heart. <laughs> right. Before we jump into your midlife, I want to see um, a couple of comments and see if you have any other comments. And then let's hop into midlife. Um, sure. So just to set the stage, if I'm doing my math correctly, You've had Parkinson's for 14 years. Yes. You were in your 40s when you were diagnosed. 48. And first. 48, okay. And you've had uh, deep brain stimulation now for about 10 years then. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Yeah. Kendra, in the comments, Kendra said that uh, they had DBS on the earlier side as well, but only on one side, and that um, their untreated side is worse than their original side now. Um, they say that major symptoms are tremors and dystonia. Could you just speak to that? What's your experience? Well, m- my symptoms early on were pretty much all one-sided. They were left-sided, you know, in there. And all the rigidity and slow motion was all on one side. Mm-hmm. And for me, there was a curiosity. Do you, because I was faced with the decision, do you have DBS on both sides or one? And they gave me a choice. But for me, 
I wanted to actually see if DVS was really making a difference on my less affected side. And so in a way, you become your own control group, right? Mm -hmm. You measure your affected side versus your unaffected side. And, and I was sort of using the analogy of construction on a house renovation. When you have the walls open and you're wiring for speakers, you might as well wire the whole thing. <laughs> it's a good analogy. So what I've found out over time is that my right side definitely has not progressed as fast as my left side, which is quite a bit more slow. And the um, settings that they set me on originally have all really focused more on left than right. But mm -hmm. what's really interesting was I, I became involved in a, a five-year re, re research project to try to develop what's called closed-loop DBS. All right. And so what, what that meant was closed loop, regular DBS is the same voltage and settings all the time unless you manually adjust. But closed loop was supposed to take us to the next generation where it was DPS on demand. So as you needed more, it would adjust you more and it would read, read brain waves and through AI would actually make adjustments it's kind of like riding an e-bike. You know, I was in these five-year experiments where I all of a sudden felt like I could ride indefinitely based on mm -hmm. an e-bike that self-adjusted. Uh, it was really a wonderful feeling. But what, what my point on here, and to answer the question that, that comes in, is... During these research sessions, they would switch me off all day long and put me on no meds. Oof. And, and it was almost like as soon as they turned me off, I felt like a stroke had come into my body where, where my left side would sag and I, mm. I couldn't keep my eyes open. Uh, this would be something you would do put, to torture political prisoners, right? <laughs> I mean, I really honestly could see the impact of something that I was taking for granted. You know, these four volts of, of, uh, of energy had a material effect on you. And uh, when I used to give talks, I used to bring my DVS controller and I would turn it off in front of an audience. And they would watch this thing and their eyes would drop. Yeah, I mean, their mouths would drop as they would see this person just basically start to shrivel away in front of them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't do that anymore because so I had a situation where I couldn't turn it back on one time. And uh -huh. it, was, it was a little scary. So uh, I promised my, my girlfriend, Jen, that I would no, not do these show off stupid <laughs> human things anymore. Good idea. So talk to me about dystonia. I noticed your hand and, and you've talked to me about what's, what's tell us what's going on with dystonia for you. Yeah. So I'm entering this new phase now where, where some of the symptoms in the DVS are not as effective as they were before. I, mm -hmm. I'm told that you get about six really good years for the average type of patient of benefit. Some last much longer decades, and others sort of peak out at six years, and then advancing disease happens. So in my particular case, I'm starting to get more rigidity, and I'm definitely getting what's very severe dystonia in the hands and mm -hmm. in my toes, uh, to the point where it's hard to hold things, impossible to type, uh, and... and uh, it's something that I'm working on. I have these braces uh, on my hands. This is not bling. Um, <laughs> the, these are basically splints that try to hold your hand into a position where you can actually squeeze them. But I have trouble nowadays, like shifting gears on a bike outdoors, 
or, or, or holding a fist for boxing, like I can with my right hand. The dystonia is definitely catching up. Mm. And so are some of the other non-motor symptoms. The fatigue, um, the cognition. I'm speaking, trying to speak strongly right now, but my voice and the way I used to make a living, you know, talking uh, has been greatly impaired. Um, you, you're catching me at a good moment right now, but at the end of the day, I'll, I'll be just barely a whisper. I'll be like mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali who can barely get words out and, and try to signal more with whispers and, and, and things. This is all that, uh, Do you have to preserve your voice and really think about when you are going to use it and how and very much. Like, uh, knowing, today, knowing today that we were going to have this conversation, did you have to preserve your voice in the morning so you wouldn't overtax it? Yes, I did a number of things. I, I tried to preserve it in the morning. I didn't exercise in the morning like I normally do. I was going to wait till afterwards to get on the bike. Um, I, I, from time to time, will take uh, methylphenidate, which is a form of Ritalin, uh, which helps me with cognition and fatigue so that I can get words out. Uh, and my, my secret sauce special thing was right before I got on this call, I stepped on, out onto the balcony and got a whiff of cold air to get that dopamine ready. Wow, oh, that's kind of a fun strategy. Well, so let's uh, segue into the cold somewhere. So let as we segue into sort of middle life and uh, living with Parkinson's, if you were looking back at how you would have defined yourself, even even five ten years ago, living with with Parkinson's, what were some what were some nouns you would have used back then to define yourself? Um. Well, I, I like to think of myself as a warrior, you know, mm -hmm. someone who was not going to let the disease get you down and, and try to defy the odds uh, mm -hmm. in getting through that. Um, warrior might be a word that I, I'd like to be called. Um, uh, others might call that dreamer. Yeah. You know, yeah. There, was, there are many who... And this is something that I've come to learn is sort of this rah-rah, um, optimistic, to toxic optimism is not something that's always beneficial to the rest of our tribe. Mm -hmm. We run the fine line as spokespeople for our disease to show the people that the positive side of, of, of being optimistic and having faith but there is the reality also that this is a tough disease to live through day by day. And I think that balance is coming more into perspective for me as we, we've come into the last couple of years. Yeah. You I would know, have defined you, I, it, when I first met you, I would have said, and I still say, innovator, um, dream, I think dreamer, great uh, friend, athlete, um, how else? Research, researcher, research junkie. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm yeah. Like traveler, traveler. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've traveled all my professional career uh, internationally. I'm one of the few Parkinson's people that have 3 million actual travel miles, and that's but in the seat miles of travel. And, and one million of that happened in the last, you, you know, since my diagnosis. That's um, amazing. Well, that's another part of it, right? Is that with Parkinson's, I've had to learn to sort of back off and accept that 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 that's a life of the past. And yeah. I mean, getting off of planes, going for dinner meetings. One dinner meeting in a different country than flying back from Europe. I can't do that anymore. That that would destroy me. 
in there. And so you kind of back off from that. But I still love travel. I still um, have found other ways to do it. I put a tent on the top of my car. And Jen and I drive across the country camping and meeting friends, which has been something new for me that I would not have thought about uh, in my past life. Um, So let's talk about your current life, your middle life as you're, you know, evolve as we're all aging and evolving with our, with our uh, aging bodies and with your disease process. Um, What does midlife look like for you and how are you, what's your philosophy now and how are you living with Parkinson's now? Well, midlife has has been a splash of cold water on my face. You know, um, since moving here to Boulder, uh, I moved here in 2019 uh, and then was continuing work. And then 2020, sort of the world changed in a dramatic way. COVID hit. And while I was continuing to work that year, uh, I faced a number of personal uh, insults to my life, which really changed things. My younger brother passed away from park or from from um, cancer, uh, and then this wonderful career that I had came to a complete screeching halt all in the same week as my brother's passing, uh, mm-hmm. because I we had a restructuring. And unfortunately, I, I was laid off in that. And so all of a sudden, this happy-go-lucky guy was dealing with the realities of the world, of family members getting sick, um, trying to get to a memorial service during COVID when everyone was telling you, don't go. And then all of a sudden, in the same week, losing my employment, an employment of, you know, almost a 30 year career, you know, kind of came to a screeching halt. <clears throat> and at that point, I really started to see the degradation of our fellow patients out there. You know, I would run into them. We were in, all living in social isolation. And the Davis Finney Foundation posted an interesting article on what they were calling sarcopenia, which is muscle wasting, where you basically, you see this in cancer patients and you see this in the elderly, where muscle mass just degrades. And and all of a sudden, I was watching this very healthy tribe around me starting to sort of diminish in health. And so I started really asking myself, is this what midlife is all about, right? Midlife Parkinson's. Uh, and so, you, you know, I went from this life of, you know, high speeds, not as high as when I was a re- executive recruiter, but this full life of, you know, nine to five Zoom calls um, for work and then squeezing in a workout and then going, you know, getting on the bike on the weekends with people like yourself and Davis, all of a sudden to like, I'm not even sure I can get on a bike right now, you know, and I'm going through this fog of cloud, trying to deal with insurance companies on disability, you know, trying to show people that I, I wasn't as healthy as I really was faking to so Mm -hmm. many people. Yeah. Uh, it was a very tough time and a very, uh, it was some dark days for me to be very frank. Uh, I was very fortunate to have uh, my care partner in the world, uh, the care partner in my life, come out uh, to help me with the replacement in my battery. And then COVID hit and she moved in. Uh, indefinitely because she couldn't go back to Michigan. And Mm -hmm. and that partnership saved my life, you know, uh, in there. Um, Yeah, amazing, isn't she? 
Oh, well, for those of us who try to do this alone, it's a very challenging thing. And to find the right person who can show the caring and the affection to help you get by is, is, is worth a, it's invaluable, I should say. Um, but what this thing taught me though, this era, and I'm still learning this right now, is that Parkinson's is not a passing fad. You know, it's here to stay and we've got to deal with it and live on. And it took me back to the days of when I used to train in martial arts and when I was a college student, I, I, I was able to take one or two electives because we were science majors. Uh, but I took a course uh, on Chinese history and going back to my roots as an Asian American, I started thinking about uh, this thing called Taoism or Taoism. And so my current thinking now as I enter this mid stage of, of Parkinson's is a philosophical change uh, on how to think about the Tao of Parkinson's. Tao translated is the path or the way or the road. And so what I'm thinking about now is how do I deal with Parkinson's through this midlife crisis uh, or mid-stage as I did in my early stage to prolong the longevity and, and the living well that I did in stage mm -hmm. one? Uh, and the, the, the word Tao is, has been used in modern days as well. That Taoism uh, came is hundreds of years old maybe, uh, from the old Chinese philosophy. But you may have seen it in more modern days. Bruce Lee, for example, used what he calls the Tao of the intercepting fist, which is in the 1970s was something that he really professed. And in the 1980s, someone wrote on Tao as the Tao of Pooh. I remember that. Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> right, trying to translate living well through any of the Pooh characters. So here I am in 2023, trying to define what is the Tao of Parkinson's in here. And How do you I start, define that? I'm sorry? How do you define that? What does that look like for you? Well, I've been starting to prepare for an upcoming talk that I'm giving uh, to, to a... Uh, it's a keynote address and I've been doing some research on this, not to get bogged down in the philosophical uh, academic side, but Taoism as I understand comes down to three main pillars, which really do hit home for me. Those three pillars are simplicity in life, learning patience and developing compassion. Mm. And through the course of my days, I've tried to find elements of all three of those pillars that I've adapted to. So for instance, simplicity. My life is a lot simpler now than before because my job is to get on that bike back there every day and make sure that I can do a route for 30, 40 minutes and work up because I know that helps me out get better. Somebody asked if you ride a two, Kendra asked, do you do a two or three wheel bike? I use a two, but it's been interesting for me because with the um, uh, introduction of the dystonia in my hands and I'm getting it in my eyes a little bit where I blink and sometimes it's slow to open. Uh, I'm wondering if I'm safe on the road and so I'm going through Botox in my hands and eyes to see if I can Im improve that. Mm. Um, I, I have not yet gone to a three wheel, but it may be that's my- a, that's, an indoor, that's an indoor trainer there behind you. Yeah, that's it? the Wahoo trainer that I use uh, five days a week or, or more. Yeah, I'm addicted to that bike out there. Yeah, it's my best friend that got me through uh, COVID, but I did get an e-bike uh, when I turned 60, 
Uh, my parents uh, gifted me a gravel e-bike, which I love it and I can't wait to get back on because when when you have uh, the battery assisted help, you yeah. feel like you could do a lot more riding. And I'm not done yet. I've still got a no. lot of riding to do in my life. Absolutely. Yeah. So what do you feel like if you, you said you get on that indoor trainer five days a week. What do you feel like if you don't get on a trainer or you don't exercise? Yeah. When I'm traveling and I don't have access to the bike, I feel sluggish. I mean, the symptoms, the lightness, there, there's two, I think there are two elements that, that, that you, you come through when you have the, dedication to an exercise. One is you get up in the morning and you prepare your day so that you go out there and train. And then there's a physical act of doing it. Um, you just feel better afterwards. It, it, setting goals uh, and preparing for events really helps me out because I, I'm the type A person that likes to push myself a little bit harder than I should. But mm -hmm. I feel that if I push myself, uh, I'm only getting better. But you, well, if you saw me getting off that bike uh, after some of the rides that we're preparing for this tour, this Wahooligan tour, I'm second wind and I'm almost like a zombie. <laughs> uh, in fact, you're reminding me I've got to get back on and start because the Wahooligan event, for those of you who don't know, is this great virtual ride. It's our metaverse where we actually ride against ourselves in a virtual way. But it's so much fun. I'm addicted to that now. Yeah. So, yeah, Kevin, you yeah, you sure did. Thank you. So, I want to take you back to your Tao of Parkinson's. Uh, you started with uh, simplicity was, and you were talking about the sim. Your routine is is fairly simple now compared to what it was. Definitely, and I've learned to say no to things too. Mm -hmm. I, I say yes to everything. You know, every committee, every Zoom call, every uh, talk, I, I would accept them without fail. I think part of it was I didn't want to miss out. But now being able to cut things off has real benefit on there. Patience is the second pillar. And this idea to say that, you know, I'm moving slow, uh, but that's okay, right? And you just build more time in, you know. It, when, when I park the car and try to get out, it, it takes me what seem, must seem like an eternity to, to, to unbuckle my seatbelt and, and get out. But mm. to me, that's okay. I've accepted. Now, the thing that is the harder thing is being patient with others because they may not know what we're going through and you can't get angry at them. You've got to learn to educate them. And I think that's some part of the learning that I'm going through right now. So patience and for yourself and patience for others, it sounds like. That's right. Yeah. And as part of that patience, what I've been doing is accepting the weaknesses that I have and now working on training those weaknesses. So for instance, my workout now is not like the boot camps, boxing, that I used to go through where we would just work ourselves into the ground. Nowadays, I may split my workouts into one third cardiovascular, one third balance and dexterity, and one third weight training uh, mm -hmm. in there. And the thing that I, I'm not the most balanced person anymore. But I love spending time on a BOSU ball with one leg uh, and trying to hold it up and shifting with different dumbbells uh, and things in there 
just to try to work the things that I know are going to let me live longer uh, in there. It's an acceptance and a, of hey, it's patience in a different way. You mm -hmm. still do things, but you're the days of getting out there and, and riding sixty miles. Uh, that that's hard for me. Yeah. Even on and an e-bike. I'm sorry. Even on an e-bike, it's hard. Yeah, I, I haven't pushed it that far. I don't know if the battery would last that long. Yeah. Uh, Helen here asks if, uh, do you think treadmill could be used for walking, light, easy walking? She says she doesn't want to do marathon stuff. Yeah. You know, this past summer, um, the Brian Grant uh, Foundation, Brian himself asked if I would join his relay team. And I'm not the greatest walker anymore. In fact, I ski better than I walk. Mm -hmm. uh, but I use the treadmill a lot. We were going through a heat wave this summer and I couldn't get outside in a hundred degree heat to walk. So I walked every day on the treadmill uh, and built up my mileage and my very slow pace. Um, I think the, the key is pick whatever tool you can use and a tool that you enjoy and then do it. Uh, and then set little goals, you know. If you can go, you know, at a certain pace for, for three miles today, try for three and a half, to, you know, tomorrow. And I, again, I'm, I'm a real geek. I, I tend to chart everything out there because I like report cards where I show that I'm doing well. <laughs> All right, so we've gone through simplicity. And patience. oh, and the final one is compassion, simplicity, patience, and then the final one is compassion. And, and how do you how does that show up in your life? Well, compassion is something that I, in order to be compassionate, you have to be um, aware, and I think the sense of aware of the people around you uh, is so critically important. Uh, so I've met some of the best people through Parkinson's. You know, I, I mean, the people in the foundation, the board, the ambassadors, you, you all are my friends that I will call on when I need help. And likewise, I would hope that you would call me if you need some assistance on things. Um, compassion to me is gratitude. And there's a great movie out right now. Sturtz, have you heard or seen it? I haven't seen it yet, but it's been recommended a few times. Yeah. So it's called yeah. Sturtz, right? S-T-U-R-T-C. Yeah, Sturtz it happens to be a therapist that has Parkinson's. And he talks about the tools of gratitude and other therapeutic tools that he uses in his counseling uh, for his patients. But I found that his model for picturing and allowing gratefulness, even during your dark days, to help drive the positive things in your life, to be really, really um, beneficial to me. Hmm. You know, this triad of the Tao that I'm trying to discover is still work in progress. I, I don't think I'm there even close to the tip of this iceberg, but I think I, I think I had it down for phase one or era one. As mm -hmm. I mentioned, era two, I think it's integral to thriving well as Parkinson's takes over more of my life. And, and, and so I, I'm thinking as I'm contemplating this Tao of Parkinson's, why? I mean, why is it important? Well, it's allowing me to dig out now from my dark days, you know, but it's more than just digging out, Polly. It, it's actually allowing you to flourish. We, we talk about 
every day is a victory. And we have to celebrate those victories. Uh, and the victories become harder as, as we enter more of this mid-stage Parkinson's. Um, but what I'm hoping that it does is it allows you to really live well and stretch what could be a two-year period into another decade. That would be my absolute goal in here. And then finally, it, it helps you prepare for the late stage when you finally, it comes our way. Because I think it's, if you live this journey of, of handling a positive and accepting it for what you have now, at the end, you, you'll, you'll sort of be embracing it versus fighting it on there. Yeah. Uh, that's my hopes with this towel. Is is to find the way of Parkinson's. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I'm looking at a comment from Dawn here who says uh, they've just started and um, stunned how much they still have to learn. Um, it's humbling to meet people who have gone through more. So your your leadership in this and your the way you are discovering your path uh, is really helpful for others to see and and model some of the things you've experienced and take pieces of what you've done and what others have done to to make it easier for them thanks thanks Wally. you know I, I'm, I the most rewarding situation happened to me a few weeks ago um, oh, yeah. where someone was introduced to me and they they called me and said you, you know a mutual friend says that I need to come and talk to you to learn more about the science of what's going on with Parkinson's. He'd been a recent newly diagnosed uh, patient. Um, anyway, we had a conversation which started with the science, but ended on this philosophy in life on dealing with it. And, and he wrote me a thank you note afterwards say, I came wanting to learn about the technical aspects of the disease and I came away after our morning together with a better appreciation on philosophy and life. Mm -hmm. And that just touched my heart because we, we, he was going through a really challenging part in his acceptance in the early time. And I was glad to be able to let him put him on the track of thinking. You know, we talk about the palliative model of, 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 of Parkinson's care, but part, of, part and parcel of this palliative care is figuring out the, the entire journey of what we're facing here. So yeah. the beginning will teach you a lot and you want to master it. And, and you'll go through that phase of, of feeling really like, I think I'm, I'm just starting to get it. And, and then you'll hit this mid phase and then you'll have to adjust. And I'm hoping that that mid phase becomes just a, equally as celebrated as it was for me for the first part, the first decade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Am I getting too <laughs> philosophical? No, not for me. Certainly, hopefully, our audience uh, can can take some some learnings from that, and and uh, sort of the approach that you're you're leading into, which which is really helpful. And you know, acceptance and adaptation is what I'm hearing. Is every new thing that's thrown at you, it looks like you're adapting to incorporate a new approach to living well with with Parkinson's. And, you know, when I asked you half an hour ago, how you would have defined yourself 10 or so years ago today, Kevin, as we're wrapping up, how do you define yourself today? I like to think that I'm an ongoing scholar. Yeah. Like I'm oh. still learning and, and trying to, um, digest what, what's coming my way 
and, and digesting in a way that I can give it back to the community and also help myself at the same time. Mm, that's wonderful. If you could go back and talk to Kevin 14 years ago, what would you tell him now? Oh, get off your cocky ass, you know? <laughs> it's like, yeah, we think we know it. I mean, I talk to my, I think about my own life with my, as a kid with my parents. And then I look at, you know, my college age and post-college kids. And we always think we have all the answers. Mm, uh, don't we? But, but uh, Parkinson's is very humbling. It's humbling in the sense that it will always challenge you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he, all I can say is, I'll, I'll close with this one thing that my martial arts teacher used to tell me. They said, in times of peace and tranquility, a brick house is, is, is the right structure. Uh, but in turbulent times like typhoons and hurricanes, bamboo survives. I think that what we need to know is when to be the brick house and when to be bamboo. Mm. And, 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 and being floppy sometimes is actually a stronger way to be. And so for me, I'm hoping to adopt that change, that adjustment, uh, which is coming my way. I love that. That just gave me goosebumps. What a great yeah. way to close out our conversation. Well, it's, I've enjoyed this a lot as well. It's always great talking with you. And it's great to I talk. hope that um, for the people viewing this, that, that you know, you, you get your own nuggets and develop your own philosophy on how to deal with this because it's a long road and you you all will have your own ways and of coping and adjusting. But just know that we all have are doing this as we speak. Yeah. And we're here at the Davis Finney Foundation. So feel yes. free to reach out. You can contact many of our all of our ambassadors through the Davis Finney Foundation website if you're looking for others like Kevin to connect to and share experiences and, and we're here for you. So please feel free to reach out to our website and find us and, and connect with us. Thank you all for watching. Kevin, thank you for being here for all you're doing for our community and look forward to catching up with you again. My pleasure, Polly. You be right. well. You too. Be well. Be that bamboo structure. There you go. Bye-bye. Take care.